What's up guys, this is Heiss, and today we have something that's been coming for a long, long time. Last year, when I went to the East Broad Top for the Winter Spectacular, we also spent a fair amount of time at the Rock Hill Trolley Museum. Um, good friend of the channel, channel member, Brill Bus Boot Camp, messaged us and say, hey, if you guys want to come see the trolley museum, I'd be happy to give you a tour around. Brill gave us a wonderful tour, and he really is such a knowledgeable and passionate, wonderful person that knows a ton about all these different interurban trolley, a little bit of everything from early transit. And getting to get a tour of the whole museum from him was just absolutely wonderful so huge thank you and we had cameras rolling along so you're going to get to hear about all of this wonderful cool history at the rock hill trolley museum from someone who really really knows it and go for a little bit of a trolley ride so let's jump into the tour and see what we can learn today Oh, and I will note that there is going to be a two-parter. I got to play with a PCC car and got to run electrified traction for the first time, uh, making a trifecta of steam, diesel, and electric now. So uh, thanks to Brill, I was able to have that experience, and it's super cool. That'll be coming in part two. Let's go jump into the tour. Much like, well, Colorado Railroad Museum, where you take your train and actually run it on other railroads. Yes. Uh, an electric railway museum is the opposite end of the spectrum from an art museum where stuff sits on the wall and that's all it ever does. Yes. We are actually working with a very interesting group called the Pop-Up Metro. That's one of their trains behind this painted unlettered Penn Central N5. That is a battery electric train. Uh, it used to be some non-standard, larger than typical loading gauge London Underground stock. Okay. A company owned by one of the EBT Foundation um, trustees. They retrofitted them with batteries and control equipment. They control like a freaking model train. There is nothing that creeps slower on rails than those <laughs> things that I got to try on Friday. But yeah, they're demonstrating it here. They even have a modular platform out there to show people how this works. And basically the idea is it's low investment public transportation. And I am totally here for that idea. I think everyone is. They've got a pair of those trains here, and you now there's talk of running them on the Princeton Dinky, as well as uh, potentially connecting from the new Wawa station that SEPTA just opened up, southeast Pennsylvania, out to Westchester. Which I'd be sad to see the, the old arrow set go on the Dinky. <laughs> yeah. Uh, We'll see how it pans out, though. It's a lovely bunch of people there. They're very cooperative, and it's been lovely hosting them here. We've got the spark, and we're sp spreading it back out in the world, seeing where it catches fire. That always is good. How zappy is the spark? Well, Just 600 volts DC. 600 DC? Hearts. Okay. It's spicy, but not the spiciest. Exactly. Well, that's so this cool. this is Car Barn 1. This is a joint facility between Trolley Museum and the EBT. This went up pretty much as soon as people got ideas of preserving stuff here in Rock Hill Furnace. So half the building is East Broadtop side. They have their door over there. Ah. We've got our standard gauge track out the front. <laughs> Absolutely. That piece there, which will need a ton of work, is a Tuscarora Valley Railroad coach, which a friend of mine here at the museum discovered or was told about, I forget which, but that's privately owned by him, and it is truly a chicken coop restoration in waiting. Yeah. Welcome to Oldwood Cars. Yep. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, you can... I mean, hey, you can it's internally braced, so it's not going to fall over anytime soon. That's always helpful. So the open car. So 1875 here is a very neat car. Um, it's nominally an American design, but actually it's a bit of a mutt containing British parts, American parts, and a whole lot of Brazilian parts because that's where it operated. This is a Rio de Janeiro 12-inch <laughs> open car. And if you have a look at the wood, none of the color you see is varnish. This is Brazilian, Brazilian rainforest rose. hardwood. Hardwood, okay. Yeah. I was going to say, it's reminding me of my guitars. Yeah, it's in very good shape as the wood goes. If you can ignore the part where it flexes quite nicely in multiple directions as it goes down the track. Well, you know, it's fine. Uh, the stained glass Clara story? Yep. That's beautiful. 
So how we got a Rio car here was this museum started out in 1960 and we're trying to build up a trolley collection from not much. Right. So one of the ideas that a couple of the founders here had was, well, we're never going to find an American open car. They started being retired in the 20s and nobody really kept them around. But hey, I hear Rio de Janeiro has a bunch of them. I bet if we bought like a dozen at a time between a bunch of different trolley museums and got them shipped over together, we could get a decent rate on these things. So that's exactly what happened. <laughs> a coffee bean freighter loaded a dozen Rio open cars, steamed up to Philadelphia, offloaded them onto train cars. They rode to Mount Union on flat cars and then were trucked to the trolley museum. <laughs> we got three of them initially. Sadly, one was lost in a furniture factory fire where it had gone to be restored because it's a uh, giant it's, piece of furniture yes. that moves. <laughs> Very expensive furniture. From here up, yes. yes. <laughs> so that was the single trucker, number 322, unfortunately. But 1875 here uh, got fixed up pretty much all by volunteers over the years. And this car has been done over so many times. It's in the colors of Conestoga Traction Company now, which was Lancaster County, Pennsylvania's, uh, the Amish country, their trolley system. We'll get back to them in a moment. It's fair to say these things gave us amusement parks just because of people's habits. There wasn't any real good way in 1890s and uh, early 1900s to cool off at home, unless you were super rich and had a pool. So the common folk would go pay a couple cent trolley fare, go for a ride, and these things will cool you right off when they're moving down the track. All that airflow can make a 100 degree day tolerable. The trolley companies noticed people were just taking these joy rides and they were like, ooh, I see money in this. Let's give them some place to go. And thus we got Kennywood in Pittsburgh, Dorney Park in Allentown, Willow Grove outside Philadelphia. The list goes on. And of course, many others out of state that I don't know. Being that you had to maintain both open air cars for the summer and enclosed cars for the winter, as cost of labor went up and shenanigans that you needed to do to change out your winter to your summer fleet, including often only keeping one set of trucks for two sets of car bodies. Hey, cheap guys. <laughs> when you pay less to the guys to swap the cars over than you would pay to the car builders, I guess the math worked. <laughs> what a weird way to run an electric <laughs> railway. So yes, they fell out of favor early. Uh, Fairmount Park, or yes, Fairmount Park in downtown Philly ran them until 46, and they ran to uh, sh shuttle service with about 200 people on each car to the Yale Bowl in New England up until 48, and that was the swan song of the open air car in America. <laughs> so yes, imagine every end bumper, every running board, like stacked two or so people deep in every bench, possibly people sitting in each other's laps. Football fans are another breed. Yes. Well, that's really cool. And it's got flip over back seats. Yes, it does. Uh, I've got stuff sitting on top of the seats, unfortunately, so. No worries. But we, no you, can, you can see but... that there's an articulation point right in the middle, and they can go either direction. Yep. That's cool. Which makes this kind of interesting when you have it full and you have everybody switch seats at the end of the line. It's almost like they do the wave. Everybody moves back a seat because the seat back <laughs> pushes. Yeah. You know, the folks who were sitting here, now they're sitting there. It's <laughs> fun. Yeah, it's an interesting one. But also relatively early trolley era stuff and a Pennsylvania thing that's fun to plug. Uh, we have a freight motor over here whose own service history was unremarkable. Ordinary wasn't involved in anything too crazy. Uh, this was a Detroit United Railways boxcar. Uh, Interurbans had unusual shaped boxcars with the ends rounded for going around extremely sharp 90 degree city corners. Right. Uh, and they would run full-size trains. In fact, trolleys pioneered inter, um, intermodal service. The North Shore line out of Chicago up to Milwaukee started what they called ferry truck service in 1926, which was specialized trailers riding very specialized, weird-looking flat cars. For some reason, Aristocrat Trains makes these in G-scale, or made them, <laughs> of all the random prototypes. But this was the more common way to move trolley freight. Um, after its brief stint out in the long, interconnected 
railways from Michigan to Western Pennsylvania, continuous, same voltage, same gauge. They sold this as a work car to the line that operates that uh, bullet car behind us, the Philadelphia and Western, where it continued just as a work car. Uh, it was self-propelled earlier than that as the Michigan system cycled cars around. Oh. The fun trivia and how it ties into the paint scheme of Conestoga Traction over here is these things helped give us milk chocolate, as a matter of fact. Guessing the name Milton Hershey rings a bell even for those of you who don't live in the area. So after some attempts at selling caramel in Philadelphia, he uh, moved out to Hershey to try and, well, moved out to nowhere. It didn't have a name yet. <laughs> Later became Hershey. Yes. yes. <laughs> and as things gathered steam, he began to basically create the community from nothing. That's why there's still a school that bears his name. One of the public works that Milton Hershey put in was the electric railway. So, of course, he had passenger service, but he made sure to use the same gauge, same voltage, all that jazz of all his neighbors. He connected to Conestoga Traction on one end, Harrisburg Railways on the other, and we do have a car from Harrisburg in the other barn. And as the needs of the chocolate factory grew and local dairies could not supply enough milk quickly enough that it wouldn't spoil, darned if he didn't take some freight motors, order them special with extra insulation, interchange them to Conestoga Traction, to Amish farm country where you've got loads of dairies that you can tap into. And the insulated freight motors, before reefer cars were even a thing, were rushing milk to the Hershey factory to scale up production. And that's how the freight motor brought us milk chocolate. That's really cool. <laughs> wow, this history just writes itself. People did so many cool things with yeah. railways. Yeah, that's one of those things that you like don't even think about. Like, yeah. yeah Amusement parks from here, milk chocolate from there. Is that's cool. That's cool. I knew that um, in passenger cars and passenger service, all the express and important freight would go in the baggage car or the head end cars. Yeah. And a lot of times you saw on, on the little Podunk Rio Grande, you saw <laughs> trains that had one coach but five baggage cars because they're oh, yeah. hauling all the head end freight. But I had no idea that they had freight actual you know traction equipment like this yeah would, and that it yeah did what it did it would be vanishingly rare and to actually run these in train with another passenger car but that's what we had combines for as well right right uh we do not have a combine car here but there are i mean there's street cars that are built as combines uh connecticut charlie museum has one that's very much like one of our johnstown cars in the other barn <laughs> well we'll hop over from summer car talk to winter vehicle yeah scary death roller of scary deathness yep this is a snow sweeper this thing was home built in joliet illinois by the chicago and joliet electric railway why well, i'm not why am i not surprised that that was home built <laughs> if <Goose> was here, <laughs> make the funny people. part yeah. is you're looking right at the one standard part that are standard also mass produced <laughs> snow sweeper in the other barn also has <laughs> The rest oh, of the God. steeple cab strangeness is the home built bit. <laughs> Snow sweepers were a very common thing on electric railways. Because um, starting one of these, it was a relatively low bar to entry into the electric railway market. You could get together with six or so of your middle class or somewhat well off friends, and you could scrape together enough funds to start a street railway company in the boom times of the 1890s to the very, very early 1900s when. The news even talked of it as a trolley craze sweeping the country. And it even hit out as far as Denver. It truly struck all across the country. One of the rules you usually had when you acquired your legal charter for a street railway company was you have to clear snow off the tracks uh, where you have built tracks in a public street. It was a way that they expected to get some work out of having someone lay rails down your dirt or cobblestone or block streets. No, I didn't mention paved because you can use a plow to clear a paved street. An uneven surface, a plow will make an absolute wreck of it and you'll just leave a nice sheen of ice for everyone and all their horses to slip on. A snow sweeper will clear straight down to the surface of the street. Hence why so many different bundles of slightly different length sticks. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Bamboo. Bamboo. Yep. Oh, I thought they were steel rods. Nope, they're very flexible. It is very labor intensive to replace this. Some of our volunteers did this car over. Its brooms had worn away to nothing. 
over just some years of museum use. I don't think they'd been redone since this thing left uh, service in Scranton. Who was its second owner? There's a lot of secondhand exchange of trolley cars through history. Right. And that's why it's in this uh, earlier Scranton Railways orange. It later was painted blue, and I'll show you that color. They forgot to, when we restored it, they didn't bother to repaint the inside. <laughs> but yeah, so this is a, a car that would clear snow off the streets. You didn't see it very often, but there is a non-zero chance that our current president saw this car in service since he uh, remembers a bit of electric railways in Scranton. That's cool. So what's this bit with the chain? Uh, there's several That's your drive motor, you yeah. Like yeah, it, 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 it looks like it raises and lowers through these <laughs> through, through, a, through a scrap steam engine's equalization, yes. Yeah. <laughs> that is absolutely possible. I mean, home building something. And... Yeah, they, they might have found some Midwestern steam locomotive and been like, yoink. Yeah, we could, we could use that. Welcome to the world's first true bullet train. It is shaped this... like bullet. This is the first thing that combined lightweight construction, electric traction, and wind tunnel tested streamlining. This is the 1931 Philadelphia and Western Bullet Car, which was designed uh, by a fellow who was already pushing the envelope on interurban car design. Uh, Dr. Thomas Conway was his name. He later was uh, recruited to the President's Conference Committee Car Design Committee as the only guy allowed on the committee with any experience because his experience was breaking the mold like this. This is an aluminum body car over a steel frame, and darned if the JG Brill Company didn't absolutely nail how to prevent dissimilar metals corrosion. This thing held up to just shy of 60 years of revenue service on its one line, and when SEPTA cut holes in the side of it where we have little silver plates to inspect and see if it was corroding away where the metal joins the aluminum, they found no corrosion. That's incredible. After 59 years of service, and some of this car's sisters did make it to their 60th birthday, still in their original gig. That's really cool. And the crazy what, thing what, is, what, what era are they from? Marker lamp bracket. <laughs> <laughs> yup. Yeah, this thing would have been... Uh, Beautiful scarlet with silver trim um, in its original paint job. And they are truly stunning looking, but this is the 1990s look. How much to pay to put it back in the cool paint? <laughs> oh boy, this thing would need... Donate now! This thing would need an incredible <laughs> amount of work. I mean, the gasketed windows were a retrofit. Um, there's a couple cracks in places we wouldn't like them to be that w our volunteers have been mitigating and reinforcing. Uh, but you know you want to do it right yeah right to fully restore the car so yeah this could be a million restoration to truly backdate it all the way to as built wow. and on the other hand we also have the only one that actually operates because we cheated and put trolley poles on the roof this was a third rail in a Roman uh, and nobody oh, wants that liability oh. I see this box over there and it makes sense that the passengers cannot be permitted to ride on the front platform uh -huh. Um, but there's also a sign that says paddles. Is that for unruly passengers? Uh, that's a third rail thing. I mean, oh. you could probably double it as used for that, but a uh, paddle is pretty... Think of a ping pong paddle. It's okay. just a little bit more spatula shaped. That's how you isolate this car from the third rail. You oh. stick a wooden paddle between the third rail and the pickup shoes, right. Right. and that's how you get the car to, car to go cold when the third rail is always hot. Yeah, they have like flags, fusees, all that stuff uh, labeled on the different cabinets in there. Development of this thing, they sent mock-ups to a university with a wind tunnel because, I mean, think of the state of aviation in 1930. It was still, I mean, the stuff we threw into the fire early in World War II was pretty crappy aircraft all around. We didn't really know what we were doing even in the air then, so to streamline an overgrown trolley car was crazy at the time, but it really worked. And these things would do 85 miles an hour all day, every day. Good God. Back and Why forth, really? running the same line for 60 years. You can't beat it. That's, the that's seriously cool. With them starting this aluminum riveted construction in 1931, 20 years later, my own bus rolled out of the same plant, built the same way, and they had 20 years experience doing it.
<laughs> well, I think we'll have a look on the inside of the next couple of cars. All right. Starting with Johnstown 355 here. This was very much your typical city street car of the 1920s through the end of the trolley era. In Johnstown, that was 1960. So it's a steel car built by St. Louis Car Company. Johnstown had a mess of these things back in the day. There are quite the substantial fleet of them. I do not know how many, but this was the standard design and there were a couple non-standard things kicking around, including one we have out at the other barn. But they ran truly all over the, all over the town. Anybody want to call out a neighborhood where you want to go? We're headed to Franklin at the moment. The, the fact that that's just on a scroll is yep. that's that's the thing you don't think about. What did we have before we had digital oh, signs? Yep. <laughs> we, oh, roll signs are awesome. We, we had the ancient scroll. <laughs> the ancient scroll. <laughs> and I do like how, without having to look at the other side, you can yep. you like like see codes on there. So you yep. see which, which more <laughs> fur, cop, rocks, yeah. mocks, frat, <laughs> Ben and Mark. Yeah. That's cool. They, they missed the last little letter of your name, man. Sorry. Well, that's okay. I don't get my own stop. <laughs> that's yes. very fun. Roll signs are very fun. I'll see about getting permission to take this thing out the line. Sounds great. 355 right. is a real sweetheart of a streetcar. Oh, <laughs> Narrow gauge faster. Come on. stare at the t because this is some serious heist track <laughs> sorry I like clicked and I like had a spasm and then I clicked the second time and it went a yep. just like that but yeah I need to change poles on 355 here since you always should have drag the trolley pole behind you that's actually where it gets its name from uh, apparently the root words are the same as trawler fishing ships that tow their nets behind them oh really I think trolley is just a faster way to say troller, which was an early form of electric pickup from overhead wires. They tried a bunch of experimental strange schemes to connect to 600 volts overhead. And this is what they came up with that actually worked best, is just an upward sprung pole. You can either break the wire, uh, break the support infrastructure, or force the pole base down into the passenger compartment. Yeah, that's bad. Don't do that. Yep. Giant spike? What? Yeah, no. <laughs> I think I got it in the bar. Oh, okay. <laughs> I like the light for the fair deposit. Has anybody got a dime? Uh -oh. <laughs> More grape nuts? The Lone Ranger! <laughs> grape equal nuts? Grape equal nuts. <laughs> Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain! <laughs> it's just like any modern diesel locomotive, the reverser comes out too. I didn't know that. Yeah. You need the keys to drive the train. Somebody this, mentioned this thing in the center is the brake? Yes. All right. That's your brake handle, which is also your door control. So as the brakes go on, the door goes open. Yep. Okay. That's fun. That is the controller. This is a lovely box of 600 volts DC and other lovely things. Yes. And that is how you turn a very large drum full of electric contacts that uh, sends pa some power to resistors, then less power to resistors, and then no power to resistors. Mm -hmm. And that's how you don't throw all 300 volts to the motors at once. And so I say 300, because you start out in series. Oh. Uh, then, you might have seen when we blew by the photographers there at first, 
crank the controller quite a bit further, that puts it in parallel. You're running through a series of contactors that are redirecting the power a couple different ways. Transitioning, as diesel locomotives still they, do. They still do, yeah. And then you've got three resi uh, two resistance points and the no resistance point, or the running point, in full parallel. And that's when you got 600 volts in all motors. And this thing gets up and dances at that point. in Chicago 315, which is a monster of a Kuhlman car company interurban that was built to run in the Chicago area. I'm going to it's large and in charge. 1909 built car. The interesting thing with that timing is that this car's top speed of around 75 to 80 miles an hour is faster than the aircraft world record was the year it was built. It took until 1911 for an airplane to outrun this train. And That's for those who love Lincoln pin couplers in certain games, the train would get to a certain point in the line and it would split the train and go to two different destinations. So that means you were Lincoln pin coupling interurban cars every trip. Because we don't like our fingers. Nope, I cannot imagine how many fingers they went through. <laughs> Doing that and plugging in control jumpers, which is that plug up by that gorgeous whistle. And you coupled and uncoupled cars every trip. That's madness. Because For cheap me. labor and things like that. But being from the Chicagoland area, this car is practically a rolling glass museum. Every window is a double sash window. If you go to open the window to get air, you lift one window, there's another window on the other side. You gotta lift that too. That's beautiful. And that also means that wherever you have all that arched stained glass, of which there is a ton that needs to go back into the car, you have two layers of arched stained glass. Which, by the way, by the time the 1940s rolled around and they had a couple of newer cars on the property that didn't have the old arched stained glass, they thought that the public would like riding the older cars more if they looked like the newer cars and the public couldn't tell them apart. So, plate right over all the stained glass. And there yes. it sat, fortunately undisturbed in our case, and we were able to dig it out here in preservation. But they're backdating it all the way to as built, which nobody else has done. There are a lot of ca &E cars in preservation. Um, there are a few that are painted in a very early paint scheme, but I don't think anyone has gone to the Pullman green and gold leaf lettering that this car is going to end up in. It's like um, everything that's awesome about varnish passenger cars. Yes. And also in urban at the same time. Like it look it looks like one of the passenger coaches that I know in every single way with the T and G, the letterboard, the beautiful rounded windows, all the beautiful okay. ornate woodwork. But it runs itself. <laughs> and pulls a whole train of itself. Yeah. Oh. These are builder's photos. Oh my goodness. GC Kuhlman Car Company of Whoa. Cleveland, Ohio. That is, yeah, 314, so one car, uh, one car older. But yeah, that is what it looked like as built, and that's what this will look like again. And you can see how intricate the stained glass is. That's going to be incredible. The cameras, I'll wait here as folks are climbing aboard to have a look. But yeah, you can see the interior as well, which is what we'll go see on this thing next. Oh, good God, the 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 roof in here is just. Oh. Is that amazing or what? This is this is. Seriously beautiful and ornate. Somebody who is experienced in doing gold leaf on hot rod cars in the area. Right. Her uh, Facebook and social media name is Hot Rod Jen. She showed up, tattooed rocker gal, uh, about, about our age, and she's gold leafing all this stuff with the skill of someone ten times her age. That's amazing. And it was just. Yes. Awesome, the video they made of it. I was not here when she was working on this stuff, but oh my goodness, the 
care and attention it takes. And then as far as seats, do you guys have seats we or have do you the full set. you this have the full is, set? This is the uh, pilot All the restoration, yeah, the slight reupholstering. Re okay. They are very cozy. Um, they were only removed a couple years ago, so when we ran the thing when it was just in bare wood, they had the full set of seats. That's cool. That's good. We've, we've had several cars at the museum where we don't have seats or we don't have something. Oh. And it's like, we had one seat frame for the UNA 50 car that was oh, our God. most recent passenger car that we did. And uh -huh. so we had to replicate the rest from the one seat frame we oh, had. Boy. And it's like, that's well, it's a, that's a chore. Three. That's yes. Three. Little gondola work car. And yeah, we have a GE 25 tonner as well. So yeah, this is a uh, work car from, from Porto and, uh, Word is that it has had an interesting life carrying many cargoes. Huh. Um, these sort of things were usually built to haul coal to company-owned power plants, and this was known to do that. However, Porto being the economy that it is, or was at the time, I believe it still is, it's a bit of a fishing village gone large. So this was also <laughs> known to carry fish. Just <laughs> pour the fish in it from the nets, Carry them from the docks to wherever they needed to go. Okay. That's awesome. I have no idea if that's just an old-timer's tall tale or what, but it feels like it's crazy feels enough correct. to be plausible. Truth is stranger than fiction. It tends to be, doesn't it? But around here, it's our work car, so that's why it's dripping in tie tongs and shovels and lining bars and a 600-volt DC welder and a massive air compressor and tank. And on the other side <laughs> is all the air tools. <laughs> I, I hear you say 600 volt DC welder and I'm now realizing that you can just have a portable welder wherever because you just yep. hook into the cat. Yep. That's... Oxy torch. <laughs> Jitterbugs for tamping... Uh, for vibrating yourself to death, yes. Yeah, that. And maybe tamping a little bit of ballast. <laughs> yes. This is the more useful thing that... Spiker. Uh, yeah, pneumatic spiker. Yep. You got to try that out. <laughs> yeah, those are, those are also another good way to vibrate yourself to death. Mm. But they do do work quick. That's yeah, that's much better than using the hammer. So there's your 600 welder. I have actually no idea what this piece of equipment is, but it looks like they took it off a streetcar and repurposed it for something. It's neat. But yeah, this thing is the work site on wheels. That's cool. And it has really wonky old Siemens electric controllers that you turn backwards of every other trolley controller. You were turning <laughs> clockwise to take power on the standard streetcar? No, nope, forget that. Okay. You gotta unlearn that. You gotta turn it the other way with the Siemens equipment. Yeah. Okay, 1930. So a little newer than I thought. That's so cool. yeah, that is, that is one piece of Siemens equipment. We'll move on to the other one. San Diego was what kicked off what we know streetcars and light rail to be in the United States today. There were attempts at uh, making a modern streetcar involving people contracting with a defense contractor that built helicopters to try and build an LRV. Boston and San Francisco found out quite how well that worked when they got these horrible messes of cars that had a thousand parts in each door, supposedly, and found that they were not up to running in an electric railway environment. Needless to say, the, uh, the Boeing Vertol LRVs were a flop. <laughs> and a few people are trying to preserve them at museums and good luck because parts are not going to be fun to find and they are an absolute Rube Goldberg machine. So San Diego was considering reviving a I believe it was actually wiped out by a Pacific Coast hurricane um, abandoned freight branch that ran south of the city because there's a lot of traffic from San Diego down to the Mexican border at San Ysidro. So they wanted to build something along that wiped out old, I think it was a SP right of way. They saw what the Boeing Verdahl machines were like and said, none of that please. And so they went to Siemens in Germany who was building these things for Frankfurt, Germany. Got to work uh, on a specification of their own and when the first order of these things arrived, I believe it was about 1980, 
to open the line. That was the first time anybody had built a new trolley line in the United States since the original trolley era prior to the, you know, the 40s or earlier. There were a couple extensions here and there, but nothing brand new. And these started it up and it, hey, you, you worked for one of them. So I did. <laughs> it's, it's still rolling. There's still talk of new streetcar lines coming in around here. You hear a lot about the, the purple line from DC on up uh, into the Maryland side, which has been a long running project, but it'll be another new light rail line and we keep racking them up. But yeah, these proved to be extremely reliable cars. This one ran from 82 until 2014. When it was retired, uh, separated the articulation joint in the middle and sent out here in two halves. But yeah, these things were running all over San Diego and it's an integral part of their transit network now. And all began with these uh, German-built cars. And later on, the last of the U2s that San Diego received were built in the new plant in Sacramento. Well, new at the time. And now that plant is churning out LRVs for everybody. Yes. I was going to say Sound Transit has received something like 40 of their 160-some that they ordered from there. And, yep. Yeah. That's cool. Yep. It was the. This is a German-built one from Dusseldorf. That's where you get Siemens Duwag, which was the whole name at that port at that time. It was Dusseldorf Wagenfabrik. So if this is a YouTube car, does that mean it runs where the streets have no name? Quite possibly. Somebody yeah. hit him with a line. Yeah. I missed. What else is new? Sli slightly more buttons in here. Yeah. Have a look. Or have a seat. And I want to see what you think of it. This one I am not qualified on. I'm I was gonna not say. Going out to uh, run today, but there is old. <laughs> you have a combined handle over here. Yep. And then you've got all sorts of buttons, but it's got TWC, so it, it's okay. It's actually yep. probably got the first baby version of what we have at Sound Transit. Yeah. Where you have, you have a call button, but is that TWC? I don't know. I'm not sure. So I acknowledge. Yeah, uh, so... Is pushing the buttons going to do anything? I have, no. no. The poles are off the wire. This thing has no... Oh. Point. Well, maybe it's over here because you've got... You, you can set your route yep. and train number over here. And then so what TWC is, is train with wayside communications. Okay. And so you'll pass over a, a figure eight wire, a loop in the track. And there's a transponder on the train that communicates. At least in Sound Transit, it was a 19-bit... Uh, digital message and it would say hey I am car number whatever we are B1019 yep. uh, and I am running train whatever uh, yep. 19 on route 1C you know auto set the switches in my priority if you can and then okay then it would line the switches if it could and everything and but you'd also end up with okay well we're no longer a train and we're going to the shop okay well I need to line to the right and then I call the switch while sitting on the loop okay. so that if you're sitting at an interlock that's entirely controlled electronically you sit over the yep. loop you get an indication you're sitting on the loop and then you go okay well we go right and then we call the switch and then okay it lines the switch across to the right if it can and yeah. all that stuff but yeah this is uh much more modern i was gonna say as soon as i walked up it's like oh it's modern it's got a delner coupler these are th these are awesome. This is like what makes modern day transit really a thing that's modular and, and can really be realistically operated by one operator as opposed to needing a whole crew or anything is because you, when you knuckle the in, it's not knuckles, it's this whole shenanigans with locks and everything, but it also does the air and the electronic train line and everything in one go. And linkages that expose your <laughs> yeah autom autom as it comes down you automatically get the world's most scary mu setup yep. <laughs> and of course because these stick out so far you need a peligro sign yes and this here is why you keep your trolleys inside kids yeah okay halloween decorations aside because that's the most useful thing we could think to do with red arrow 61 here this is what 20 years of sitting outside will do to a freshly retired serviceable car. Yep. It sat outside for exactly 20 years and look what the thick steel casting of the steps yeah. has become. Mother Nature is uh, determined to turn all rail cars back into dirt. Yes. 
Yes, we experienced this. Nature will make mankind's works back into nature. And so it will take a whole lot to restore this car, but we do have the stuff. And in fact, one of the reasons it sat outside so long was the, the trucks went back to SEPTA, who then owned the system, and they regaged them for us. It took longer than was expected, and then the car sat out, so, you know, yeah. back burner, but we have the stuff to do it. But at the end of the day, it is now inside undercover, and yep. that is a beautiful thing. And Except when we push it out to do terror trolley with it. This is pre-high-speed rail. Um, this was what the bullet car essentially evolved from. The Philadelphia and Western, the third rail in urban from the end of the uh, Philadelphia uh, subway line, uh, out to Norristown, PA. This is what they ordered in 1927, looking for new equipment to compete with their parallel Pennsylvania Railroad uh, MP54 electric commuter line. They considered this not good enough, and just four years later, the bullet cars arrived. <laughs> wow. And then they did some work to these to lower the center of gravity and speed over motor them, speed them up a little bit. And apparently it kind of worked. It's like the idea of an SUV winning a drag race against something that actually is streamlined. <laughs> Raw power can just get you something because the SEPTA supervisor who had volunteered here for a good long while, he had stories of serious speed with Strafford cars like this one. And you would not think this brick was capable of it, but electricity is a heck of a drug. Yeah, yeah. You, you set it up right, you do the thing, yeah. What's that saying? There's no replacement for displacement? Yes, exactly. It, in, in this case, it's uh, uh, commutator size and brushes, yeah. but yes. Yeah, the uh, SEPTA yoga position would be elbow on the controller, hand on the brake, here, pay your fare, give you a transfer. <laughs> Toot. <laughs> oh yeah, dead man, toot toot. That's fine. And yes, <laughs> that was just how it worked. <laughs> because people will find a way to reinvent how to run your car. Because why not? But yes, this is like the only really intact Stratford car out there. Every other one has had like low level steps added to it. Right. Or uh, trolley poles, which this will eventually get. It actually is nominally in operational condition, but it has no trolley poles. So we would have to run it with a, what we call a bug wire or a trolley extension cord. This thing was a hopper bodied work car for hauling ash away from the coal fired generating plants okay. that uh, Philadelphia Transit Company had back in the day. It has been rebuilt so many times, there's no trace of it. In the early 80s, this thing went to, I believe it was a privately owned shop at the time. It is now the shop for the Allentown and Auburn Tourist Railroad that started up in the oh region. God. And it was remanufactured there in the 80s with tongue and groove wood siding <laughs> because the guy there was a trolley hobbyist with quite the personality, I understand, though I shouldn't speak any ill of the dearly departed. But yeah, he made this because SEPTA needed an overhead maintenance car and had no idea where to get one. So they sent an old work car to a guy who nominally restored trolleys and he built them this. And there's a work platform on the roof. I, I, I the see roof. the hatch in here and... And this thing was broad gauge and it to maintain the uh, overhead wire on the media and Sharon Hill lines that still run out of suburban Philadelphia today. That's very fun. These are two pieces of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania's street railway heritage. This is Harrisburg Railway's car 710, which is a standard Brill arch roofed double truck uh, streetcar. This is a semi-convertible car wherein these windows will slide all the way up, lower sash and upper sash, into a roof pocket and you're an open air car from here up to the letterboard. That's cool. That was a very common design. Actually 249 out front is also semi-convertible. This is Valley Railways car 12. Valley Railways uh, ran on the west shore of the Susquehanna River, so across the river from Harrisburg. So if you know the Rockville Bridge, this ran to one side of it, this ran to the other side. 
And they also both met in Market Square in downtown Harrisburg, where these guys had a bridge across the river. Part of which still stands, because a uh, hurricane named Agnes had something to say about two of those spans. And it's worth touching on how trolley systems get abandoned here as well, because hurricanes and that bridge and things all tie in as well. Valley Railways had their bridge wiped out, well, damaged beyond where the Public Utility Commission would let them run streetcars over it. Foot and motor traffic continued. But without a one-seat ride needing to transfer to even the very new buses that Valley Railways had, they were a very good Brill customer, and me being a fan of Brill motor buses, they bought a lot of very new buses from them both before and after World War II. But even still, if you don't have a one-seat ride, people will find another way to work. It's a wait, it's sitting in the weather, it's inconvenient, you forget something on one or the other vehicle, it took over from the trolleys in places, and already the customers were fleeing. So you never really had, except for a brief window for intercity buses, you never had glory days for the motor bus. But by 1939, Valley Railways had abandoned, and same for Harrisburg. They, their system for supplying traction power got damaged in that same 1936 St. Patrick's Day flood, with the expense to band-aid the system back together, when already public sentiment was the trolley was old hat. They quickly put in, plan, put in motion plans to abandon the system, and that was largely how it happened, as well as regulatory changes to basically responses to the Great Depression where you couldn't share cash between your public utility electric company and your electric railway. So yes, there's stories to tell about General Motors and Firestone Tire and Standard Oil conspiring. And at the personnel level, that happened. You had people who had corporate loyalties, potentially even conflicts of interest, you could call them, of supporting the people who paid them and they got in positions of power in places like Baltimore and Philadelphia and accelerated the scrapping. But you had so many other forces at play that it really is fair to call it a bit of a conspiracy theory in that it's, there's hints of truth to it, just enough to hook you, but it's not the whole story by any means. Right, age. right. But both of these trolleys were found years later after their bodies got sold off for adaptive reuse in buildings. <laughs> Um, some kids riding their bicycles around the neighborhood found this one and went home to their dad. Hey, daddy, daddy, there's a trolley out there. Yes, kids, we've driven down those streets for years. There's nothing there. The other people know where all the trolley bodies are. No, there's definitely a trolley. Sure enough, they found Harrisburg Railway 710, and after negotiations, we got it out of there. That's awesome. Same with Valley Railways 12, except minus the cute story of kids on bikes. But I mean, look at it. There's a whole bifold door. It even still moves. This sat there, and by the way, this is an 1895 vehicle. Wow. Here. This will be the oldest operating streetcar once we get it running, and this is next in line for a restoration. We have all the parts. That's exciting. <laughs> it is a kit ready to be put together. There is some original lettering showing through on uh, 710 here. The Co in HR Co is the clearest, but. That's cool. Yeah, they found where the original paint was. That's another nice bifold door with probably interlocked folding treadle step. No way the interlock is still intact on that thing, but uh, yeah, it's there. Ooh, another sweepy. Yes. This is a standard McGuire Cummings manufacturing snow sweeper. These things were freaking everywhere. Pittsburgh, Allentown, Harrisburg, Hershey, Johnstown. On down the list all over Pennsylvania and multiply that by everywhere else. Because this one's from Iowa. This ran on the Mason City and Clear Lake, which has slowly evolved into Iowa, Tr Iowa Terminal, I believe is the name. The folks who brought the Baldwin Westinghouse trolley-powered electric locomotives out to meet the big boy when it went by because they still run a freight railroad oh, on the same hardware we run on. Right. Yeah, okay. Yep, Iowa Traction, Iowa Terminal. I always forget which it is. Traction. That's yes. cool. This actually came from them somewhat indirectly. It was a very convoluted trade where we traded a DC Transit snow sweeper that was very old, 1890, I forget what, down to the museum in Washington that had tragically lost theirs in a car barn fire. Mm. 
Um, but so it kind of made their collection whole again, and this still needs some work. There were some gremlins that the museum that was contracted to restore it actually wasn't able to test because timeline shenanigans, so we actually need to fix a bent axle. Eventually, three will be running, and it's super cool to have a true standard single truck sweeper in the collection. That is but cool. Yeah, single truck, crazy high center of gravity. There's a massive traction motor behind that sliding door to run the brooms. <laughs> also derailment prone machines. Well, yeah. Once in a while, as you're maintaining old equipment, you need to be extra careful because Plow 10 here is currently sidelined because of a electric shock hazard from the controller handle. Ah, oh, also yeah. Also does not have low voltage controls, that shock yeah. hazard is all 600 of the volts. Yeah, yeah. Right. 10 probably holds the record in this collection for the longest serving vehicle in its original home. It is a 1915 product of Wasson Manufacturing of Springfield, Massachusetts. Was sent straight to the Philadelphia and Western and it served there until 1987 when we got it. Goodness. I'm not a math major, but that's a career and a half. It's long, yeah. Fun other story, which I have asked several times if this sounds like a tall tale, but I have heard several people tell me, no, that conversation happened. So SEPTA took over the P&W, of course, and they're still running it today. Norristown High Speed Line. High Speed Line, in quotes, they lowered the speed line a while ago. Everybody teases them about it. There's a pattern to that public entity awkwardness, we will call it. A certain weather event happened in 1993 in these parts that was a massive snowstorm. Um, we had this, of course we got it in 87, we had it running by then. We actually got a call from SEPTA asking if they could get it back. <laughs> I believe it was after the snow had already fallen because they only had a Plymouth believe it was diesel mechanical or something locomotive, a relatively new, you know, not exactly a vintage industrial switcher, but you know the type. It didn't even have cab heat, and it had a plow on one end, and that's how they were trying to make up for the big specialized for double track electric railway snow plow. It was not cutting it. They had to shut the line down. Meanwhile, some of our guys came out here a couple days later and did a plow fan trip because they can, and because you have the toys, you might as well play with them. While SEPTA shut the line down. <laughs> this, <laughs> the, this is the most railroad thing I've ever heard. We took off our face, nose to spite our own face, and can we, can we get it back? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we would love to work with you, however, there's like, Five feet of snow between us and you. Yeah, we can't exactly just get... I mean, we'd have to plow ourselves to you, and by the time we get... Yeah, yeah, we can get a mile and a half that way. And, um, yeah, you can pick us up on Route 522. Uh, you know, the turnpike is just down the way. Oh, wait, that's covered in snow, too. Yeah. <laughs> that's hilarious. That is can we get our plow back? So here is some more JG Brill Company products here. This is a true subway car. This thing ran across the Ben Franklin Bridge in Philly, Philly to Camden, what is now the Patco High Speed Line. So another piece of jersey here. Absolutely. Actually uh, is a collection of subway cars, sitting historic subway cars stored in Philadelphia that SEPTA tried to get rid of. And the city found out about it. And it turns out the city buys all the subway cars, even going way back in the day. And so they said, uh-uh, don't you touch those. Those are my trains. They're your tracks, but they're my trains. Hands off. We were talking about scary MU pins earlier. Oh, yeah. No, these are scary MU pins. These are very scary MU pins. But yes, 1936, very Art Deco-styled subway car. That's we cool. are poking and prodding it, getting it running again. Because you'll see we did retrofit trolley poles. That thing did run. It is extremely heavy. The axle loading on that thing is massive. It probably should be a six axle if you were to run it on this light of rail. But no, we're not re-trucking it. 
the thing just makes all the creaks and groans in the track when it runs. It's fine. But yes, it needs brake repair. It needs wire insulation and closing the darn electrical cabinet that looks like Frankenstein's lab. And then it should be good to go. This thing's neat. The triple articulated machine. Oh goodness, is it really? Built as an electro liner by the St. Louis Car Company. It has Here's when we have ridden two St. Louis Car Company products before. And yes, there are two of these. They are a beautiful, matchless story of preservation success. One train is back in Illinois at the Illinois Railway Museum where they can run it like they stole it back in original Chicago to Milwaukee North Shore Line configuration. The way this ran from 41 until 63. So this is the Liberty Liner and it will take just a bit longer but you really ought to see the bar car because that's a thing. They grilled hamburgers on there on the North Shore. They served booze in there on the P&W. It's five o'clock somewhere. We're going home from work. Absolutely. Let's hit up the bar while we're on our way home. Check out how each car body shares the truck. It's cool. Center truck is unpowered. Everything else is powered. And they're two. They're basically two different trolleys articulated together. Gotcha. You can control half the train, which we do, because it dims the lights with only half the train running. Good heavens. Yeah, 1941, <laughs> only two trains built, 100% survive. That is, that does win. Word is they did a test trip at 100 miles an hour. Good. Found that uh, the crossing signals did not come down in time at 100 miles an hour. Naturally. And the North Shore never repeated that experiment. But, but, but there is, in fact, a bar. Welcome to the Tavern Lounge. Hello, sir. What will you be having today? <laughs> I'll be having some gold. <laughs> some gold. You have gold consortium. <laughs> Potentially. In some real life hilarity, though. So trolley museums are forever exchanging parts. Illinois Railway Museum asked us for a grill. <laughs> An original North Shore Line grill the Electro Burger on it. Grill. The Electro Burger. That is what they called it. Right there it is in the menu. The Electro Burger. For a buck twenty-five. Holy cow, these prices are amazing. <laughs> yeah, this is this is no five guys Ooh, here. Liquors. Your they burger have. is cheap. <laughs> bourbon? We have a Canadian. Ooh. Ooh. Canadian. We have more Whiskey. bourbon. <laughs> Whiskey. Scotch and more scotch. What are all these whiskey prices less than a dollar? No. <laughs> Dies. I'll take all of them on the rocks Gin. to go. Gin? Oh, guys, there's rum! There's why, is, rum. Why, why is the rum always gone? Why is the rum always gone? <laughs> and the. the, the they don't tell you what kinds. The, the yellow seats really, really sell me on the rest of the interior design in here. Oh, you know what's really silly? It's painted over here. I, I don't think they ever painted it over in the other train. Um, but there was a design here that was a bunch of jungle animals, like in cartoon style. <laughs> like the elephant is playing tug of war with the tiger. It is ridiculousness. Oh, and by the way, the original paint job for this was orange, teal, and there was some salmon pink mixed in here and there. Yeah, was, man. <laughs> was the paint job as built. Oh my goodness. This thing is a vibe. It most certainly is. Again, I have to say a huge thank you to Brill Bus Boot Camp. Uh, Brill, feel free and post anything down in the comments. I'll make sure to pin it. Brill was such a wonderful host, and I hope you enjoyed learning from him as much as we did. And remember to stick around and wait for part two, where we're going to get an in-depth look at one of the most prolific kinds of cars out there and take it out for a spin, the PCC car. So thanks so much for watching. We'll catch you all next time. <laughs>